whatever industry you pick, if you outwork everybody, if you try to be a little smarter than everybody, if you try to be a better salesperson than everybody, if you try to be better prepared than everybody, you've got your best chance because if you don't do it and somebody else does, you know, I have the saying, work like someone's trying to take it all away from you. You know, work, mm -hmm. I actually work mm -hmm. like someone's spending 24 hours, working 24 hours to take it all away from you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the way I look at it. What would you say is the number one reason why people fail? Lack of brains, lack of effort. Lack of brains, lack of effort. Yeah, they just, they don't do the work. They don't learn, you know. When you walk in the room, when you start a business and you start to talk about somebody, you're, you're never in a vacuum with no competition. You know, unless you're just, extremely lucky and if there's going to be competition that means somebody else knows your business as well as you do when you get started and if you walk into a competitive environment and they still know more about the business than you do and more about your customers you're gonna lose but most people don't consider that they don't do the work they don't learn more about their industry they don't know even about their business I mean and so you've got to put in the effort to know more about your industry than anybody else um, and that's that's the brains part and that's the effort part as well because look if you're competing with me you you better know what you're doing otherwise I'm gonna kick your ass you know and you're not gonna outwork me and so you know the combination is usually what kills businesses early on more than anything you could within a five ten minute minute interview say this dude's not gonna make it as an entrepreneur yeah I mean I can I can typically tell right I can tell um, but by um, their passion I can tell by their focus, I can tell by their preparation. You know, there, there's a whole realm of things in any business. Here, you know, here's here's the business you're in, and here's a thousand things that influence whether or not you're going to be successful. You know, through my experience in businesses, I can put myself in his position and say, okay, here are 900 of the thousand things he has to be aware of, and then go through and ask. And by how many of those or her um, issues they've been able to address already, that kind of gives me a sense of how hard they're willing to work. You know, and I can tell by the questions they ask me. So all I have to do is say, okay, what do you want to know? And you know, when they start saying, what should I do? They ask you. Yeah, well, you know, and that's fine, right? And I want them to ask questions, but you know, people like to say, you know, the only stupid questions are the one you don't, ones you don't ask, and that's not right, right? Because the questions you ask tell me, tell whoever, more about you than anything else you do. Because in particular, it tells me about your preparation. If you ask me questions about just basic things that you should have known and you should have down to a science, that's going to disqualify you almost more than anything. If you're not always learning, if to this minute, if, if I'm not continuously learning, if I'm not just absorbing as much as I can absorb, someone else is going to kick my ass, right? So you talk about paranoia. The, the greatest source of your paranoia should be knowledge. If someone else knows more than you do, and if you're not learning, if you don't know, the if you don't know how to learn, if you don't have a thirst for learning and acquiring information, you're, you're SOL. Do you think there needs to be a healthy level of paranoia? Oh, absolutely. There needs to be. Oh, yeah. I okay. mean, I always say, you know, for every one of my businesses, I, I say, what would I do to kick my own ass? You right? So whatever business you have, there's somebody trying to put you out of business. There's somebody trying to, to take a bite out of mm -hmm. your business. Mm -hmm. And it's better for you to figure out how they're going to do it rather than they do it. Um, and so, yeah, that's being paranoid. And so you have to be paranoid. You have to anticipate other people's next moves. And you can't ever, you know, downplay the competition. I was at a business plan competition this morning for, at a college and they were kind of being dismissive of the competition and so you can't ever do that. You know, they're out there trying to take you down and they're not just going to sit still and if you're good, really, really good, you're going to inspire them to work even harder, faster, better. And so you have to be, you know, very self-aware of what you're good at and what other people are good at and, you know, a healthy dose of paranoia makes a big difference. I mean, it's very helpful. Let's transition to a different subject with college. Uh -huh. You went to IU, yep. right? Now you got a lot of people that uh, say, uh, forget about school, you know, they're drop idiots. out of school. They're, they're idiots. So you think they're, they're idiots. idiots. Tell me why. Um, if you're going to have and run a business, if you don't understand accounting, you're already behind the eight ball. Can't you hire a guy that's, that knows how to But then they, they still have to communicate to you. Your accountant might tell you, you're profitable, but your cash is going down. You know, not understanding um, the breakdown. And, and when you don't, do you think you need college to learn that? Yeah, I think you do, right? Because it, it may not, for some people, look, if you're so self-motivated that you can take an online course in accounting and teach yourself everything, you're way ahead of the game anyways. But most people aren't. I don't care if you go to a community college and take accounting and, and spend 99 bucks for the class. Just, you know, 
spending the money forces you to be more obligated to do it. But accounting, finance, lesser extent marketing, sales if the school offers that, these are all the, that's the language of business. And so while it's possible to teach yourself these things, and while it's possible to hire them, mm -hmm. when you're starting your own company, you don't wanna to have to spend money hiring an accountant. Well, let me take that. If you've gone through all these classes, you probably don't have to hire a lawyer to incorporate, right? Got you can it. probably figure it out yourself. And so your cost of opening up a business drops, but even more important than all that, that's that's the blocking and tackling. That's the language of business. You know, the thing I learned at Indiana that was more important than anything else, I learned how to learn. And learning became far more important to me because the one certainty in business is that it's always going to be changing. Um, how does one entrepreneur increase the speed and areas that they can increase. There's certain things you can't control. Speed in one speed. way. Speed of growing your business. All right. So, so how fast can I grow? Yeah, I mean, it just depends. You've got to know your own skill set, right? And you've got to know how that fits within your company's life cycle. Um, you know, some companies are slow, slow grind. And you just have to understand that. And you've just got to bide your time until, until it starts to click and then grow with it quickly. You know, if you're trying to release a product that needs to be ubiquitous, You've got to go um, as fast as you can, and and then you know release hope, a product, yeah, like a just, launch. Yeah, and and you know there, there's a lot of people who will say you know perfection is the enemy of profitability, right? And that doesn't mean you have to wait till it's a perfect product. It really just depends on what the product is. It you know a, a barber shop, right? Is it an app? Is it um, a service? Is it a product? But you know the the key is looking for the low hanging fruit. What are the what are what customers are willing to write you a check or commit to it, you know, so that they're willing to integrate it into their daily lives or integrate it into their daily business. And so, getting a commitment either through time or revenue is typically what I look for. And so, if I can get a commitment, then I'm I'm going to be able to learn. I'm going to see how they use it. Do they sustain usage? And then once I get the next one you know, hopefully it came a little bit faster than the first mm -hmm. one. Then I can ask for referrals, and then the next one, then the next one, and I just try to ramp it up. You know, when I bought the Mavs, we, we had no season ticket holder base. And so literally, it was a, a matter of just putting a list of former season ticket holders in a white pages back then, you know, on my desk next to my phone, and making phone calls. You. Yeah, me. Yeah, because if I'm not going to do it, so how can I expect someone else to, to do me. it, right? So just get on the phone. Hey, this is Mark Cuter. I'm the new owner of the Dallas <laughs> Mavericks. You know, I'd like to invite you back for a game. It's not, though. This is my business. But you, 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 we can't get regular sales guys or something to make those calls once they get to a quarter. You, you're a guy yeah, that's yeah. a billionaire. You're making those well, calls. But that's all, you know, and that's fine and good, right? Because everybody's got their own goals, right? And But still, I, I don't want anybody at the Mavs to be able to say, well, he's not willing to do the work, right? There's... You know, if I walk around, I'm picking up all the papers. I'm not saying go get that picked up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's trash. I'm picking it up. Um, so, but in terms of speed of growth, it, it's really, you got to get that first customer first. And then when you get that first, what did you learn? Reiterate, get that next customer. And then hopefully as you learn more and more through the process, then the next one, the next one, the next one becomes, comes by even faster. You know, alluding to it earlier about entrepreneurs being born or built, you know, and I think they're, I knew I was wired to be excited about business. How or why, I don't know, but you know, and there's certain guys that have the genetics to jump out of the gym, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's certain guys, you know, that, you know, when they golf, they have the muscle memory and, and the discipline. You know, Dirk, um, the Visky may not be the most talented guy in the NBA, but his discipline and his focus to do what's necessary to be successful, he's willing to do and combine it with being seven feet tall and being skilled, you know, it makes him an amazing basketball player. So it's, it's understanding what your skill set is, finding the right place to use those skills, and then going for it. You know, will that make you 250 grand? It depends if you pick the right industry. You know, I started my first business when I was 12. I was buying and selling um, baseball cards, buying and selling stamps, anything I could do to make money, I, I was hustling and trying to do. So I was into business, but I, I not so much where it was, all my friends were into it with me, so they wouldn't know. And baseball so, cards. Yeah, baseball cards, you name it. I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and so I would, probably even less than 12 years old, I would go out and buy a bunch of baseball cards that I collected, and I would package, I would say, okay, you're guaranteed to have a Pittsburgh Pirate in this package, and I would charge three times as much, and I'd set up on this park bench down in the park down in Scott Township where I grew up, and um, I'd have these little sales, and it was great. I made money, and I, I mean, it was, you know, and I, I learned as much about business 
when I was 9, 10, and 12 as I, I learned any other time. The Book of the Prophet Nahum This short, prophetic book is a collection of poems announcing the downfall of one of Israel's worst oppressors, the ancient empire of Assyria, and its capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians arose as one of the world's first great empires, and their expansion into Israel resulted in the total destruction and exile of the northern kingdom and its tribes. The Assyrian armies were violent and destructive on a scale that the world had never seen before, and so Israel and its neighbors were awaiting the downfall of Assyria, which eventually came in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians rose up and began a rebellion that overtook Nineveh and brought down the Assyrian Empire. And so chapter 2 depicts the fall of Nineveh in vivid poetry, and chapter 3 then explores the downfall of the empire as a whole. But this book isn't just an angry tirade against Israel's enemies. The introductory chapter shows us that there is way, way more going on here. The book opens with an incomplete alphabet poem that begins by describing a powerful appearance of God's glory. It's very similar to how the previous book, Micah, began and how the next book, Habakkuk, is going to conclude. And it's God, the all-powerful creator, coming to confront the nations and bring his justice on their evil. And the poem opens by quoting from the famous line of God's self-description after the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He won't leave evil unpunished. And so the rest of the poem goes back and forth, contrasting the fate of the arrogant, violent nations with the fate of God's faithful remnant. When God brings down all the arrogant empires, he will provide refuge for those who humble themselves before him. Now, here's what's really interesting, is that you thought this book was only about Assyria, but Nahum actually nowhere mentions Nineveh or Assyria in chapter 1. And when he describes the downfall of the bad guys, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon, which happened much later in history. And not only that, Nahum also describes the downfall of the bad guys as good news for the remnant of God's people. It's a direct allusion to Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so all these little details from chapter 1, they come together to make a key point. For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how God is at work in history in every age, how he won't allow the arrogant or violent empires of our world to endure forever. And so the message of Nahum is actually very similar to that of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history, and Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. With this perspective from the opening chapter, the book then returns to its focus on Assyria. And so chapter 2 describes the Battle of Nineveh and the overthrow of the city in progressive stages. So first we see the front line of Babylonian soldiers, and then we read about the charge of the chariots, and then the chaos on the city walls as the city is breached, then the slaughter of Nineveh's people, then the plundering of the city. Chapter 3 goes on to describe the results of the city's downfall for the empire as a whole. So Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city whose kings built it with the blood of the innocent. It's an image of how injustice was built into the very system that made Assyria so successful. But their violence has sown the seeds of their own destruction, and so Assyria will fall before Babylon. The book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of Assyria. He's stricken with a fatal wound, and from among all the nations that he once oppressed, no one comes to help him. Rather, they sing and celebrate his destruction. And that's how the book ends. Now, this is a gloomy book, but it's important to see how Nahum's message addresses the tragic and perpetual cycles of human violence and oppression in every age. Human history is filled with tribes and nations elevating themselves and using violence to take what they want, resulting in the death of the innocent. And the book of Nahum uses Assyria and Babylon as examples to tell us that God is grieved and that he cares about the death of the innocent and that his goodness and his justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of oppressive nations. And God's judgment on evil is good news, unless, of course, you happen to be Assyria. Which brings us all the way back to the conclusion of that opening poem in chapter 1, which tells us that the Lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. 
And so the little book of Nahum invites every reader to humble themselves before God's justice and to trust that in his time he will bring down the oppressors of every time and place. And that's what the book of Nahum is all about. Then you will truly be success. Turn the page. And we know all things work together for the good. Gotta work together. The good. Gotta work together. Oh. And we know all things work together for the good. Gotta work together. The good to those who love God. He God's word on your lips. To those who are called. Meditate on your day. And According to be his purpose, to do what purpose. it's his purpose, Ooh. not mine. We are now in the book of Nahum. Everybody say Nahum. Nahum, the first chapter and the first verse. A prophecy concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and the idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace, celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. And that ends our reading for today. You know, one of the reasons I really think it is important for us to read all of the Bible and for us to be challenged to read every book of the Bible is because the Bible is filled with difficult texts. And if we never wrestle with the difficult texts, we never see God in a new way. It was the coldest winter day and my night class ended later than expected. So I had to take the late train from Princeton and it wasn't coming for another hour. I thought about staying in my classroom for another 30 minutes just to avoid standing outside in the cold. But then I realized that the security guards might lock the building with me inside of it. So I hopped in a cab and rolled the 10 minute drive to Princeton Junction. When I arrived, it was 1020. The train wasn't coming until 1120. And as soon as I stepped onto the track, two things happened. First, they announced a 15 minute delay. And second, I looked to discover to the left of me a waiting room that was locked for the night. That meant I had to stand outside in the freezing, chilling, pneumonia giving cold. It was so cold, my face turned into a Klondike bar. What would you do for a Klondike bar? All right, Sean, stay focused. No way in the world was I going to make it for another hour. I looked around for any sign of warmth. In the distance, on the other side of the tracks, I saw a long line of cabs waiting. I ran toward those cabs like the prodigal son returning to his father's house. 
The first cab driver looked at me with condescending, mean-looking eyes, but I didn't care. I was cold and I needed some heat. He rolled down the window. Sir, my train doesn't come for another hour. Do you mind if I sit in your cab for a little bit just to warm up? I, I, I will pay you if I have to. I could tell he was from another country. His accent gave it away, but he smiled after I repeated myself a couple times and said, get in. Sitting in that car was like hot chocolate on a Christmas morning. Heat never felt so good. And the cab driver, his name was Wisdom, didn't charge me a dime. The longer I sat in that warm car, the more I realized how fortunate I am. It was an eye opener because many people catch that train every day and wait hours for that late train to come. Many people sleep under that tunnel every single night and wake up numb and hungry. Many do not have heat in their homes and they are only making it because of a stack of blankets and a few considerate landlords. In that cab, I became convicted, challenged and grateful. I was convicted for being ungrateful at times. I was challenged to do more as a Christian during the winter months and I was grateful again that God is faithful. You see, it's one thing to pray for the homeless. It's another thing altogether to go to the subway and serve hot coffee and tea in the winter for no other reason except to express the love of Jesus through demonstration, not just proclamation. I became grateful again for the little things that I tend to overlook. I thanked God for a car in drivable condition. I thanked God for heat and air conditioning. I thanked God for gas money to keep the tank full so I can drive where I need to go. I thanked God for the house waiting for me after I got off the train. And I thanked God for the manifold ways God has protected me from the eye of the storm. Nahum was that prophet who announced judgment on the Ninevites. Jonah was the warning. Nahum was the verdict. While Nineveh responded to Jonah with repentance, their apology was temporary. They were only grateful for God providing heat in the moment. But when they stepped out of the taxi, they went back to things as usual. Even still, the Lord was slow to anger and quick to love. One of the attributes we often overlook about God is his patience. God is long suffering. God does not react emotionally, if you will. Often God waits and waits and waits and waits and waits and waits for us to get it. And then God still gives us chance after chance after chance after chance. But Nahum teaches us an important lesson. Just like the parent who doesn't joy in putting his child on punishment, God doesn't rush to judgment. Eventually, there will come a day that God will have to make us turn in our keys. Eventually, there will come a day when God will tell us that we cannot go to the prom. Eventually, there may come a day where God will tell us to write, I will not steal the sugar cookie again from the supermarket a hundred times until we learn the lesson he's trying to teach us long ago. My arm is still hurting from the time my mother made me write, I will not steal the sugar cookie again from the supermarket. Today, let's learn to give thanks for all the things even the things that don't feel too good. Give thanks, not just on Thanksgiving, but every day. Why? Because a grateful heart is a godly heart. And the best way to build gratitude is to step outside of your convenience and sit in a position you've never sat in before. Visit an orphanage or a local hospital. Talk to people who are struggling in ways you have never struggled with before. Catch the bus or walk to work and see the world from the eyes of another. Today, make a decision not to complain, but to give thanks. Thank God for his long love. Thank God for the minutes and moments God used to get your attention. Here's a hard one. Thank God for his correction. Thank God for his loving correction, his compassionate correction. Thank God for the points on your metaphorical license that taught you how to slow down before you ended up losing your life or taking someone else's. This is a hard lesson, but it is a real one. God loves you too much to leave you where you are. He is calling you higher so that you can one day extend the same love that the taxi driver, wisdom, extended to me. 
Sometimes we only learn how to keep others warm after we've been standing outside in the cold ourselves. So what is your worship work? As God was with you, learn to be that with others. Be slow to anger and quick to love. What if the instruction to wear our masks to help keep others safe is a reminder that we need to think twice before we speak? Today, look for an opportunity to be a blessing to someone. Day 49, and I want to read Nahum chapter 1, 1 through 3. The Burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. As I'm thinking about assignment, my question is, Lord, am I like you? When I think about calling, my question should be, Lord, am I like you? Number one, Nineveh is the same place that Jonah ran away from. Jonah was the warning. Nahum was the verdict. And when we meet Nahum, we see a definitive God around what he will do for those children who were not listening. Number one, God is jealous. Many people talk about this particular ascription for different reasons, but what I will say is that God loves us enough to only want us. God does not want you to be with anyone else. And in that same way, you should reflect the heart of commitment the way God is committed to us. Number two, he's slow to anger. In business, in life, in purpose, in leadership, you will find yourself angry, but do not sin. The Lord is our boss. The Lord is our purpose coach telling us, be angry, but sin not. When you find yourself angry, what do you do? I want you to take this evaluation test of your anger to see if you really have the anger responses of God or if you still got a little bit of growing to do. For all of it is purposeful.